Thank you so much for the introduction, Teo. Um, I am going to, is it, is it working? Yep, it's working. Um, so uh, I, entitled the, I titled the talk today, Trials and Tribulations, um, Stakeholder Engagement to Support Biomedical HIV Prevention Trials in China. And I'm going to tell you about uh, work that I'm doing that is funded by GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, so that's my disclosure statement. Um, and they support us um, at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center to do two things. Um, one is to, uh, is more uh, scientific um, advice on uh, protocols that they're developing and implementing. And the other is to help them with um, sort of navigating the complex environment uh, uh, of China. Um, the reason they, um, came to us for that is, um, there's sort of three parts to that, and I'll just go through that very briefly. So um, ADARC is um, a center that's led by Dr. David Ho, uh, and um, as some of you may know, is going to be moving to Columbia uh, Medical Center um, about a year from now, uh, which is why Teo said that I w my, may be your future colleague. Um, so uh, David Ho has been uh, working in China at the request of the government of China to help address the HIV epidemic since um, around 2002, where he introduced and trained the first cadre of doctors um, to administer antiretroviral therapy. Um, I have been at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center since 2004, um, helping him th think through, um, coordinate, manage, and now, in theory, direct um, our activities in China. Um, and so we have um, a deep sort of and long history in China. And my own background is that I studied Chinese studies. I lived there um, and uh, dragged my family there to do my doctoral research. So um, I have a personal long uh, history there as well. Um, ADARC, as you also may know, has, is, has done a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies developing antiretroviral therapies and helping them uh, in their clinical investigations of such products. Um, and Marty Markowitz is our clinical director, and he and David Ho have, have um, really done, a, been at the sort of forefront of a lot of those studies. Um, when David Ho heard about a long, an, a, a, a product that GSK had called, Cabo, or at that time called GSK 7744, uh, now called Cabotegravir, um, he thought that this would be an amazing PrEP product because it had, uh, it had properties that made it amenable to long-acting um, formulation and therefore an injectable uh, uh, administration. And so um, our center offered to do uh, studies, uh, preclinical studies in macaques uh, as proof of concept that this could work for prevention. At that time, uh, this was before oral PrEP had been approved and uh, the company was not entirely uh, convinced they wanted to move in that direction. But David uh, said, uh, with his typical foresight, give it to me, we'll test it, and then see what you think. So um, my colleague Marty Markowitz and Chastity Andrews, they, they did that and they tested it, and it worked beautifully. Um, in the macaque model, it pre prevented against uh, intrarectal um, exposure to HIV 100%, uh, and they also tested against intravaginal challenge and um, uh, uh, intravenous challenge. And it wasn't 100% for those other transmission um, roots, but, but uh, over 80%. So with that um, and, and work that others did uh, and work GSK did internally, they decided that they did think this was a good product. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the Cabotegravir prep program was born. Um, and along, while all this work was going on, we were really thinking about China as a context to test this. Um, and so, uh, we are continuing that discussion uh, with, with GSK um, to do just that in China. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about the portion that I work on, uh, which is the stakeholder engagement piece. As you know, the Cabotegravir product is being tested in huge global studies through the network, through HPTN, uh, and those are ongoing in parallel and really are the, the, where the effort, the, the focus of the effort um, is for Cabotegravir. Cabotegravir development. Uh, so what we're doing is a little bit of a side project, but in my opinion, equally important, uh, especially given the incredibly high rates of incidence um, among MSM in China. So the, China, the GSK China program uh, on Cabotegravir has two studies that are ongoing right now. One is um, an incidence study, 
so it's a, they call it a low intervention study, which means that they are, uh, it's basically a prospective cohort uh, of men that they're following to observe incidents of HIV and STIs. Uh, and it's also about feasibility. Can the sites that they have chosen to work with retain, recruit and retain high risk MSM? Uh, because that really hasn't been done very much in China in the past. Um, so that study launched in, August, in uh, September 2017 and is ongoing. Um, and then the second just launched uh, last month, and it's a PK study, a safety, tolerability, acceptability, and PK study of cabotegravir in um, healthy men in China. And so this is to ensure that the PK profile and the safety and acceptability is not different in Chinese bodies in, and in China at, than it is um, in, in other populations where it has already been tested. Um, so as I said, a GSK contracted ADAR to, to provide two services. One is uh, scientific and clinical input into the protocol development um, and its implementation, uh, which Marty Markowitz leads, and I sort of help him as I can, uh, and then guidance on engagement with multiple stakeholders in what is a complex environment and also unfamiliar to uh, GSK or the team that's running the effort at GSK. So um, we decided to go with what was out there and what was easy and what also had been translated into Chinese already, uh, which is the GPP framework, the Good Participatory Practices Framework that was developed by UNAIDS and AVAC. Um, we, we felt it was important to have a framework sort of to hang our hat on and to, um, and to use materials that were already in Chinese and, and, uh, and, uh, and try to figure out how this could be done in China. Because while these materials had been translated and there had been some efforts around vac uh, preparation for trials in the context of vaccines um, funded by IAVI a few years earlier, there really haven't been any HIV prevention studies in China, biomedical HIV prevention studies in China. Um, so the objectives of the GPP guideline put out by AVAC um, are to set a global standard practice for stakeholder engagement and to provide um, trial funders, sponsors, and research teams with guidance on how to engage with the different stakeholders at each process, at each step of the process in the trial. Um, so this is what we're doing. Um, it, this is a, I don't know, for any of you who have a programmatic background, this is a log, uh, a logical model, a log frame. Um, and, uh, and this is what I call our programmatic piece of the work. So. Um, so, you know, we have inputs, we're gathering resources for the program. We have activities that we do based on those resources. We have outputs, which are products and services resulting from the implementation. We have effects that we hoped, or maybe this, ho desired effects. Um, and then we have population level impacts. We know we're not really getting, uh, this is a stretch, of course, especially if we think about change in health status of the population, but that's sort of the, the goal. Um, and we designed three buckets of um, activities. The first is formative research, um, and I'll give you a flavor of each of those, um, uh, and I'll give you some more in-depth um, uh, presentation on some of the formative research. Um, we have capacity building activities um, for trial implementers, which includes the actual clinical trial staff and the recruitment partners in the community. Um, and then we have community awareness and literacy building around clinical trials and biomedical HIV prevention. Um, so just to give you a sense, there are in this, um, in GSK's China program, there are nine sites in eight cities. Uh, and, the, and we decided to do our GPP program in just four of them. I would like to say this was very well thought out and was because we had some tri you know, ideas to compare. We really had budget limitations. We chose four. They were willing to work with us. Um, some others were not willing to work with us. So uh, we chose the four that are in blue, um, a site in Be Beijing, Shang another in Shanghai, uh, that uh, the Teo actually visited um, a city in, uh, called Changsha, which is much smaller than the others and much less sophisticated in this type of work, uh, and then Guangzhou, where you may have heard there's a weird sound health issue going on, similar to Cuba, which is fascinating. Anyway, uh, so that's our sites. So the formative research, uh, we started with a stakeholder mapping. Um, and this sort of is a very simplified version of what we did. We looked at uh, the different stakeholders in the HIV 
prevention space in China. And we started with the trial participant at the center, uh, and then we looked at community stakeholders. And I think maybe we should rename this like site level stakeholders. But these are CBOs, um, MSM community, and their family members and uh, friends, um, the hospital, most importantly, and the, the research staff there. Um, so these are sort of site level stakeholders. Then we have um, national level stakeholders. Uh, so we have the Chinese government, the Chinese CDC, who would be in charge of implementing any prevention interventions. Uh, Fudan University is our main partner, our academic partner. Um, and then Blue D is like the Chinese grinder equivalent uh, with 80 million users uh, across China. And then we have international stakeholders where we are listed as well as GSK, Vive, who actually owns the drug, um, and PPD is the uh, contract research organization that, that implements their studies. So, so that's the sort of an example of the stakeholder mapping we did, and we, you know, we've talked to people at all those levels. We've tried to get their sense of what they understand the environment to be, their, what they think the challenges would be, um, and um, yeah. So that's that's that. Uh, I won't go through this except to say that the sort of two research activities that have an IRB protocol associated with them um, are these two. So one is an in-depth interview study. Uh, where we recruited 100 um, uh, gay uh, and bisexual men and transgender women who have sex with men uh, to participate in a one-time interview um, around their attitudes and knowledge and, uh, and intention to participate in future prevention trials. So um, we did that uh, between January and, and, uh, and April of this year. Teo came to China and trained our interviewers with me. Um, and those are completely transcribed, uh, most translated, and we're undergoing analysis now. So at a future time, I'd love to present on those findings. Um, we also did a cross-sectional community survey, uh, which we've also have been, uh, has been completed recently, and I'll present uh, on one of the outcomes that we looked at. Um, that was a survey of, a of 713 MSM in the four sites. Um, and their uh, knowledge and attitudes towards biomedical prevention methods. Um, so more focused on you know, PrEP and PEP than research around those topics. Um, so the second uh, set of activities are around capacity building. So we created stakeholder advisory groups at each of the sites that bring together stakeholders uh, for in-person meetings four times a year. Um, it's a little thing but it actually has a huge impact on just creating those connections and focusing attention uh, on this project. So a lot of these stakeholders work together all the time or in parallel, um, and, but they don't take the time to actually think about this project um, because they're so busy doing their routine work. So it's a, it's, a, it's a meeting place for the diverse stakeholders. Some of our SAGs also uh, have participants in the studies on them. Um, so that they can also sort of voice their opinions about how the studies are going. Um, we are doing in August um, a, a training on anal health that Brian Kuttner, our postdoc here at the HIV Center, is going to come and do for us. Um, through the interviews, what one, and through really all of our interactions, we, uh, we understood that anal health is, is, is not well understood. Uh, by the people who are supposed to be providing uh, this kind of, these kind of services to gay, sexually active gay men. Um, and so we decided to do a little bit of an experiment and see if we can do a training uh, for uh, medical providers, including nurses and doctors at STI clinics, at an ARV clinics, um, and with the VCT counselors, most of whom are gay men, uh, around anal health and sexuality. Um, I say it's an experiment because we, uh, it's, it's something that Brian has done in other settings and it you know, seems uh, like it works in other settings, but we don't know how it's going to work in China. We've had a very enthusiastic response in terms of the people we've might, invited are very excited about it and say it's desperately needed. Um, but we're going to make this into a research, an implementation science research project where we really assess the um, acceptability and appropriateness of this kind of a training in that context. So stay tuned for, for that. Um, so that's that. So, and then the last thing is community awareness and literacy. Um, so we have a mixture of training workshops that we do with CBOs, with community members, um, and social media posts. 
Uh, I've never written a social media post in my life, so this is all, again, an experiment. But, but we're, we're learning as we're doing. Um, we have topics that are more, um, you know, that are prep specific, and you see this had almost 10,000 views, which sounds like a big number, except in China, where it's really small. But uh, then we have um, things that are more about clinical research, um, which surprisingly, we are surprised that there are actually people who are interested in, about, in reading about this. Um, uh, and of course, the, these are not great metrics, right? They're just like, how many people viewed this? Um, I don't think it's very rich data to understand if this is having any impact. But um, one of the things we're also planning this summer is an evaluation of our GPP program. So we have hired an external evaluator who's a sociology doctoral student um, at USC with a deep understanding of, he's a, he's a Chinese guy who's worked on HIV in the MSM community in China for years and now is doing his doctorate in the US. So he's going back this summer and evaluating um, all of these uh, activities through qualitative interviews. We thought a lot about metrics, quantitative metrics with which to measure the effects, and we just felt like we weren't, we weren't getting, what well, we couldn't come up with a design that would work, so we're, um, uh, and, and we feel that qualitative, by talking to the different stakeholders who are involved in these programs, we hope that he would get a sense of what the uh, program is doing so far and give us ideas about how to redirect our efforts, how to change, how to tweak uh, for the second year of the program. So this is just a picture um, of one of our community events that happened last week. Um, I like that they made it a GPP party. Um, I, 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 I put this on because it sort of broke my heart when I saw this because this is you know, a super safe space for gay men um, and None of them, I mean, many of them wanted their faces covered um, because they didn't want their picture as a gay man out there, um, which I think speaks to the stigma um, uh, and sort of fears of disclosure issues um, that are really rampant in China. I did like how they did it. I thought it was very cute. Um, all right, so for the cross-sectional studies, um, we wanted to know what MSM know and think about biomedical HIV prevention in 2018. Let's see how much. Um, and um, these are the three aims. I'm only going to talk about the first aim here. Um, so Jeff Parsons, many of you may know uh, about his paper on the motivational prep cascade, um, where he sort of created this cascade where someone was, where gay men were um, on, in their contemplation about prep use. Um, so they could be in pre-contemplation, unwilling to take prep or does not self-identify as a good candidate for PrEP, um, PrEP contemplation stage two, willing to take PrEP and self-identifies as a good candidate. Preparation, meaning he has a potential PrEP provider that he knows and can reach um, and has the intention to start. Um, <clears throat> PrEP action and initiation has spoken with the provider and has actually initiated PrEP. And then five, um, is adherent and returning to quarterly visits as, as sort of suggested by the guidance in this country. So we adapted his survey questions for use in China and we administered it to 713 community recruited MSM and we're currently analyzing that data. Um, to back up a step, PrEP is not available in China. Uh, there's no regulatory approval for it. The drug exists um, uh, because it's a treatment drug. Um, but you have to buy it yourself uh, for the equivalent of $3,500 a year, which is not really uh, reasonable for most people in China. Um, so there's no regulatory approval, but people are buying it uh, through buyer's clubs, and they're buying it, um, they're going to Thailand to buy it, um, and the plane ticket costs less than you know, the, the drug supply. Um, and so there is PrEP uptake, but it's very low uh, at this point, and uh, no one knows anything about these early uh, early adopters. So um, we created a prep cascade, motivational prep, prep cascade in our survey, and here is Jeff Parsons' data, and here is our data. Um, so this first thing is objective identification. Are you an HIV negative and sexually active man? Um, and are you eligible by you through the modified CDC criteria? So you see here in the US, um, 
in our sample, we, we made HIV negative and sexually active with men an entry criteria. So we have 100% that meet this, meet this criteria. And then when we looked at the modified CDC criteria, um, we saw that 46% of our sample uh, were eligible compared to 64% of Jeff's sample. Um, oh, yeah. uh, then, we talk, then we thought about um, who was actually contemplating taking PrEP. And what is important to note is that this, the, the big, the, what is bolded, this category, is made up of the intersection of this and this. So you have to say both that you're willing to take it and that you self-identify as a PrEP candidate. You would think that's the same thing, but it's not. Um, so you have to say yes to both of those things in order to be put in this PrEP contemplation stage. So what we see is that 35.4% um, of the uh, PrEP eligible uh, candidates are um, in contemplation stage. Uh, then preparation, do you have a provider? Do you intend to take it? Again, it's the intersection. It's the, it's the overlap of these two. So we have 14% who meet that. 2% initiated. Um, and then if you see here, zero are in stage five. Uh, there's one person who's actually dosing more or less correctly, but no one is returning for their visits. So, and this is something that we're hearing again and again, that people are taking PrEP. Those people who are taking PrEP are not taking it under medical supervision. They're going to Thailand and getting it, or, but there's no, uh, there's no guidance in China. So therefore, nobody's using it in a way uh, that is medically supervised. Um, so then we wanted to look at, among the PrEP-eligible men, what factors differentiates those who self-identify as PrEP candidates from those who don't? So what differentiates the objectively eligible PrEP can, uh, gay man from the subjectively eligible PrEP man? Does that, uh, uh, gay man. Does that make sense? Uh, it, I'm still making sure it makes sense in my own brain. Um, so we looked, you know, these are just... Uh, comparisons. Um, so I called the self uh, identify as PrEP appropriate candidate, you know, PrEP is for me. So these are men, uh, and, I didn't, and I didn't include on this table um, the comparison, the, the people who say PrEP is not for me, because I wanted to keep it simple. So what we see here is that there's a real difference in the cities. There are four cities, and not surprisingly, Shanghai and Beijing, they're huge metropolitan areas. I mean, they're all big cities, but um, there's something more cosmopolitan uh, about Shanghai and Beijing than the other two. Uh, and so you see that there is a difference there in the proportion of men who say, yes, PrEP is for me. So the proportion of, pre of objectively PrEP eligible men who say, also say, I think I'm a, I'm a good candidate for PrEP. Uh, no, nothing here on education, income, marital status, um, nothing on gender, nothing on sexual orientation nothing on sexual attraction, but sexual activity there is. Uh, and so men who say that in the last three months, they've, uh, in the last six months, they've only had sex with women, um, or that they haven't had sex in the past six months, um, they, were, they had lower uh, self-identification as a PrEP candidate. Um, so I should just say our entry criteria for the study was sex with a man in the last 12 months. That's why that we have some people who didn't have sex in the last six months, but did have sex in the last 12 months. We looked at sort of uh, relationship and risk behavior. So, you know, did a, having a steady partner matter? Did having a steady female partner matter? We thought, based on previous research we'd done, that men who were married to women uh, or had steady female partnerships may have a higher interest, uh, higher proportion may be interested in, in PrEP because it would allow them to keep their partner safe, um, which is something we saw in a previous study, but this did not turn out to be true here. Um, HIV positive uh, sex partner. So here, I think uh, it makes sense that people who have an HIV positive uh, partner, uh, whether on prep or uh, whether on treatment or not on treatment, um, ha higher proportion are interested uh, or self-identify as someone who could benefit from prep. Um, nothing on sort of these kind of traditional risk uh, behaviors. Um, that may be because they're all. Uh, PrEP eligible, right? They all have some measure of uh, risk, which puts them into this group, and so maybe that's why we don't see this. Um, we looked at recreational drug use, group sex, and commercial sex, and the, the frequencies were very low, so I didn't, I mean, like five people, 15 people. Um, it concerns me because I feel 
I'm actually very proud of the data because it really, most of it makes sense, which is not always the case in data that I've collected in China, in that I feel it's reliable data. Uh, this makes, gives me pause. I think this, the, 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 this is very low. Um, we looked at psychosocial uh, factors and testing behavior as well. So not surprisingly, people who we divided into, you know, people who said, I don't know what PrEP is, people who had incorrect knowledge, so they didn't know how effect, we asked them how effective is it, and they said, you know, 50% or 70%. So we made a 90% PrEP effective as the correct knowledge about PrEP. Um, so you see people who have, even people who have incorrect knowledge, but certainly people who have correct knowledge um, have higher uh, sort of uh, self-identification of PrEP eligibility. PrEP eligibility uh, than those who don't know about PrEP, not surprising. Um, people who ha know anybody who is a PrEP user, um, it seems if you know someone, maybe you are more likely to think that maybe I'm also um, someone who could benefit. Um, Self-perception of HIV risk, we had one question, how likely do you think it is in the next five years that you may become infected with HIV? It's a very crude measure, but uh, it's worked in other studies we've done, so we used it. Um, do you know anybody who's infected with HIV? Um, are you afraid of HIV? These are all three things that we've used in other studies and they seem to always show up. Um, and then we looked at frequency of testing. And again, it seems like the very frequent testers uh, for STIs and for HIV are more likely to think that they might benefit. Again, it all makes sense, which is so nice when you're analyzing this data. Um, so then, um, <laughs> We tried to create a PrEP perceptions scale, and it had two sides. There were 10 items that were po uh, negative uh, and five items that were positive. Um, and again, we are just analyzing it, which is why this is a little busy and I haven't collapsed categories, but it gives you a sense um, of the things that seem to different, make people different, differentiate people between the two groups. So this shows up. I don't like the idea of medication to prevent illness. I worry taking PrEP every day would be bad for my body. Um, I worry that, and then a lot about what other people think. Um, I worry that people would see me taking PrEP and think I have HIV. They would think that I'm promiscuous. Um, and then I'm doing well using condoms. I don't think I need PrEP. Um, there's a question whether this should be a negative perception or not. Um, it may be in the wrong place. Uh, and then positive perceptions, all of them show up. So um, PrEP can decrease new HIV uh, infections in the community. Taking PrEP every day will protect me. Taking PrEP will decrease my anxiety. Um, I will have more agency over my sex life. And using PrEP will increase my intimacy. So um, all of those sh show up. We, did, we then ran, did a multivariable um, model. And, uh, and we, we had initially wanted to analyze them as one scale with reverse coding. But, um, that isn't working for some reason. And again, we're just doing this now, so I don't have good explanations yet. But when we put them in as two different scales, they do seem to work. Um, so here basically are the results um, compared to Shanghai, um, you know, Changsha and Guangzhou, uh, are, people are much less likely to self-identify. Um, age seems to matter uh, with uh, people um, over 30 being more likely to think that PrEP might be for them, which we were a little surprised about. Um, knowledge of PrEP effect, um, and then those perception scales, and, and uh, self-perception of risk, and then frequency of HIV testing. So all the things that we based, many of the things we saw show up here again. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, in terms of next step, as you see, we have an active research program as well as an active programmatic component in China. Um, we are really trying to use this opportunity that has been given to us through the funding from GSK to, to understand more about the population that will be recruited for future studies um, and also who are potential future users of PrEP products. Um, we are conducting the analysis of, from the on the cross-sectional data for the other aims I, I noted. Um, we're analyzing that qualitative data, and then uh, we're doing that evaluation that I mentioned uh, through in-depth interviews with about 40 stakeholders. Um, this is my acknowledgement slide. Uh, all of this work is only possible because of David Ho, uh, Marty Markowitz, and Yu Meng Wu, who is my coordinator who gets, does everything. Um, 
at the HIV Center, um, Teo and also Lori, who obviously has dual affiliations. Um, at GSK, Jeffrey Liu um, is running the day-to-day -day op operations. Um, Mel is sort of the visionary above him, and Hao Yu is, uh, is a former colleague of mine who now works there, who is also getting the work done. And then these are our Chinese collaborators um, who are actually implementing everything on the ground. So thank you. Okay, let's take a few questions before we move to the next few. I was wondering, it was really interesting data, especially, especially you know, seeing the, uh, the, uh, the performance of the quarterly test, which is very shocking, considering what we what we support in. I, I was wondering, you know, given the social media marketing of PrEP, the, the non-FDA regulated sort of TV ads, and the extent people in China are seeing these, not from a healthcare practitioner uh -huh. in these cases. It could be interesting to track what's their perception of the you know silver bulletness of the approach. Are they a hundred percent you know very confident, perfect, foolproof? Yeah. Are they, you know, do they have doubts? Sort of a range. And also you kind of before and after undertaking this survey, because maybe seeing so much effort from medical professionals on PrEP, mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see if that alone makes people think that PrEP must be such a foolproof solution. Yeah. I think that'd be good data to have, especially given how PrEP is being marketed, to see how, how are people perceiving this relatively new intervention as um, being kind of a silver bullet. Yeah. So I think, one, I think you, you touch on something that I think about a lot. Like how much does our research intervention, our research how much does contact with research, so a survey or an interview, actually act as an intervention? It's something I've always wanted to think about. Uh, exactly what you're saying. Like, does the fact that we're spending, they see us all spending effort and money to do this somehow right. increase their belief in whatever it is we're studying? Um, that's very interesting. I'm wondering if you, know, you might add a question. Like, how, how confident are you based on mm -hmm. what you know about yeah. PrEP from one to 10? Yeah. Well, one of the positive PrEP perceptions gets at that in terms of how, con I don't know how it's phrased now, how much do you believe it is going to keep me safe from HIV? So that might be a problem. So we could look at that alone. How does, do these responses stack up um, in comparison with the way other gay and bisexual populations in the rest of the world have answered the same question? I don't know is the answer. I think uh, my attempt, I mean, putting Jeff's Parsons data next to mine is the first attempt. This is something I did yesterday, and I haven't fully digested how they compare. I mean, what's interesting is that that Jeff's data was collected in 2015, uh, so PrEP had already been FDA approved for three years in this country, whereas this is sort of pre-approval in China, but with a, a recognizing that social media means that they have access to information about it. I will say, even in the past year, attitudes have changed dramatically in China, in the community, just from you know conversations I have. So I am hoping to redo this survey a year or two or three from now, once PrEP has been approved. And this is, of course, a convenient survey. It's not a representative survey. Yes. I have two questions. Number one, given the enormous population of these gigantic cities, you can reach only a few people. Uh, do we get help from the public media and also what about social websites and internet websites? And the other thing is, I see with interest to include transgender persons. What's the legal status of transgender in China? Um, so for the second question, uh, what's the legal status? I mean, it's... Uh, it's permitted? It's permitted. I mean, yeah. And are there services available, medical transition to life? There are. They're limited, uh, but they are available. And it's possible to change your sexual identification, your gender on your on your ID card. Um, so all of that is possible. It's not to say that it's easy. Um, and to your other question, um, the, this we used. I didn't show you the recruitment um, 
sources, but we use CBOs, community-based organizations, um, to reach out. Uh, we did it through VCT clinics. We did some through online social media, um, but we didn't use like the grinder equivalent we do for this. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for having me. Um, so as Deo said, I work at the Bureau of HIV at the Health Department and I work in HIV surveillance and I'm the HIV epi liaison. So I analyze data that we get at the Health Department around the epidemic here in New York City and I go out and give presentations about that. But today I'm going to talk about what I did for my dissertation uh, a couple years ago. And that was to look at the impact on um, Nigerian men who have sex with men in terms of sexual stigma or commonly known homophobia that they were experiencing. So first I'll give you some background information on Nigeria to set the context. Nigeria has the second largest HIV epidemic globally after South Africa. That's partly due to its large population size. Um, sometimes Nigeria is referred to as the giant of Africa because it has the largest population size and the largest economy of the continent. It has an HIV prevalence in the general population of 3%. It was originally colonized by the British and gained independence in 1960. It's still you know, partly shaped by that legacy. For example, its laws criminalizing same-sex behavior were originally instituted by the British, as was the case for many countries in Africa. It is a religiously divided and very conservative country. You can see in the top left corner of this map that the top green part is the predominantly Muslim north and then the bottom yellow part is the predominantly Christian south. So Nigeria is one of the largest recipients of HIV funding from the US but it spends very little of this money on MSM. Uh, as an example I looked at the 2014 PEPFAR budget and 0.7 percent of it was spent on MSM. And in their national HIV AIDS strategy they mention MSM, you know, in a few places quickly, but there's very little in terms of actual programming that's promoted for MSM. In 2014, they passed a new law expanding the scope of criminalization uh, for same-sex behavior um, to be much worse, actually. So including sexual, you know, encounters being criminalized, they also criminalize now gatherings and meetings of sexual minorities and witnessing and abetting such meetings and gatherings. So what do we know? Um, MSM in Nigeria, like MSM in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world are disproportionately impacted by HIV as compared to the general population. They have an HIV prevalence, um, and according to the handful to 10 studies maybe that have been done in this population, that really varies based on the site, but it goes up as high as 66%. And the samples that we've, um, that essentially you see in the studies are generally younger individuals. They identify as Christian. They're primarily identifying as bisexual. They're single, and most of them identify their gender as male. Um, there are not that many studies that have looked at SDIs among Nigerian MSM, but the, those that have have found high levels of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and HPV. There are low levels of HIV testing in this population, um, high levels of condomless sex, as is the case for many MSM. Um, 
There's not much disclosure happening of same-sex behavior to heterosexual individuals or to perceived heterosexual individuals. But there is um, commonly online sex seeking or using dating apps as there is here in the US. So this is the parent study. It's called Trust RV 368 and it's based at the Institute of Human Virology at University of Maryland, Baltimore under Mancharra. It started in 2013 and is still going on. It's now one of the largest, if not the largest, cohort of MSM in Africa. And um, it uses respondent-driven sampling, which many of you know, it's a type of chain referral sampling. And it has standard eligibility criteria of being assigned male sex at birth, being at least 16 years old, and a history of receptive or insertive anal sex in the past 12 months. For the Abuja site, because there are two sites, one in Abuja and one in Lagos, and Abuja is the, the main site, it's co-located with a sexual minority-run um, CBO, which I think is really critical because it increases comfort with going to the study site in a place where um, it's dangerous to engage in same-sex behavior or to even be perceived as someone engaging in that. My dissertation analysis sample was everyone enrolled until February uh, 2016, so it was almost 1,500 individuals. And these are the characteristics of the sample. Pretty typical of what you see for MSM in Sub-Saharan Africa. Over half were under the age 25, a little over a third identified as gay or homosexual, so most identified as bisexual. Most identified as male, but you do have a minority that we could label transgender or gender diverse. 12% identified as female, and 6% identified as both male or female, or they called themselves a versatile. About half had had condomless sex in the past year, and about half had had sex with a female in the past year. 8% had disclosed to their family, very little and 22% had disclosed to a health worker. And that might only be as high as that, I realized afterwards, because a number of them were going to this MSM CBO. So they might have disclosed to a health provider there. Um, suicidal ideation, so thoughts of committing suicide, was as high as 29%. And to put that into some context, there was, a, there was one study that was published with a large national probability sample of Nigerian adults that looked at suicidal ideation and found 3% um, had thought about committing suicide in their lifetime as compared to this almost 30%. The, there were about one in five people were, had an STI, chlamydia gonorrhea, at baseline, and 37% were tested, tested positive for HIV at enrollment. So I had three primary research aims that um, I structured my papers around. The first aim was to develop a combined measure of stigma that would be reflective of common manifestations or mechanisms of stigma that occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then to assess if this aggregate measure was associated with HIV and STI prevalence. My second aim was to then assess how stigma might be associated with HIV and SDIs by looking at one possible explanatory pathway. And then third, to look at the both main and interaction effects of suicidal ideation and stigma on HIV testing. So I'm gonna start with the first aim. So I conceptualize stigma as a latent variable, which is a variable that you cannot directly observe or measure. So you have to use a series of actually measurable indicators that you believe are caused by this underlying latent variable. And so there's all sorts of different kinds of statistical modeling to account for these latent variables. So there was a three-step process. First, I did a latent class analysis to develop the aggregate stigma measure. And a latent class analysis pulls out from your data subgroups or classes of individuals that respond to the questions in similar ways. So they're similar across your indicators of your latent variable. Then I did a latent class regression similar to multivariate regression, where I looked at how were the stigma classes that emerged from step one different from each other in terms of their participant characteristics. Third, I looked at the association between the latent classes of stigma and my distal outcomes of HIV and STI prevalence. So there are many definitions of stigma. 
And I use the one that um, was published by Bruce Link and Joe Phelan in 2001. They're sociologists, and they look at stigma as a dynamic social process. And they say that it's the convergence of the following four components within a context of a power imbalance. First, that people distinguish and label human differences. Second, that dominant cultural beliefs link labeled individuals to undesirable characteristics, creating negative stereotypes. Third, that labeled individuals are placed into categories in order to separate us from them. And then labeled individuals experience status loss and discrimination that lead to unequal outcomes. And they say that a stigma or a mark is not something that's in a person, but rather is a designation or tag that others affix to a person. And I think this is an important distinction because it helps to delegitimize stigma and define it as a socially constructed phenomenon. And it also places a responsibility on the perpetrator of the stigma rather than on the person being stigmatized. I use nine indicators of stigma that have been found to be common in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the US. And there were seven types of enacted stigma. Enacted stigma is stigma that is overt behavioral expressions of stigma. And they included stigma from family, friends, the police, verbal harassment, blackmail, which is very common in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, physical assault, and forced sex. And then two types of felt stigma which is the fear that enacted stigma might occur in a given situation. And those two were fear of seeking health services and fear of walking around in public. And all the questions were asked if they believe they happen due to the fact that they have sex with other men. So it was specific to sexual stigma. So this is the results of the latent class analysis. As you remember, it pulls out subgroups from your data. And what I found was that the best fitting model was a three class model. And I labeled it high stigma, medium stigma, and low stigma. And I think you can see why. In the x-axis, we have the nine stigma indicators. And then the y-axis are conditional item probabilities, which you can consider the prevalence of each indicator within the subgroup. And so the top green line right here is the high stigma group. And you can see that on every indicator, they had a higher prevalence than any other group. Then there's the medium group in the middle. And then there's the low group. So this is an interesting reflection of kind of severity of stigma by group. But there's also interesting variability across the classes and within the classes. So fear of seeking health care was the one indicator of all nine that was high regardless of stigma subgroup. So if we were developing an intervention to address stigma that was as broadly applicable as possible in Nigeria, I would say that we might want to prioritize addressing fear of seeking health care. The other thing I thought that was noteworthy was that in the high stigma group, which is the smallest group at 195, the largest group is the medium stigma group, um, they were experiencing very high levels of more overt or aggressive forms of stigma including verbal harassment, blackmail, and physical violence. So if we were developing an intervention targeting the most impacted group, we would definitely want to address the high levels of violence that they're experiencing. So then I did the lane class regression, and I entered a number of covariates into the model, but the two that had the strongest association with higher stigma were gender and disclosure. The numbers in here you'll see in orange are adjusted odds ratios. And there are two comparisons because we have three subgroups. So there's a high class, high stigma class versus low. And then there's a medium versus low, which is a little cut off. Um, first, we'll talk about non-male gender. So individuals who identify their gender as female or both genders were much more likely to be in the high stigma group. So the first one says, essentially that individuals in the high stigma group were almost three times more likely to identify as female and they were four times as likely to identify as both genders. And then the other interesting variable that really had the strongest association with stigma and um, it makes sense is disclosure of their same-sex behavior to either a health worker, a family member, or to both. And that differentiated the, oops, sorry. Uh oh. Okay, I thought I was doing the pointer. Um, so that differentiated the medium stigma group 
from the low stigma group as well as the high stigma group from the low stigma group. Okay, and the last step was then looking at the prevalence of HIV and the prevalence of STIs for each of these stigma groups. And we have HIV prevalence here and STI prevalence here. And what you see is a sort of dose response association. As stigma severity increased, so did the prevalence of these outcomes, suggesting that there is some sort of relationship between stigma and these outcomes in this sample. Especially for HIV prevalence, which went from 27% in the low stigma group to 40% in the medium stigma group to as high as 55% in the high stigma group. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about AIM-2, which then looked at one potential explanatory pathway for this relationship. AIM-2 built off of AIM-1 in that I used these three stigma subgroups. And my first step was in doing a path model to develop a conceptual and theoretically based model. And I hypothesized that sexual stigma leads to suicidal ideation which then leads to condomless sex, which then leads to new HIV and STI infections. I then tested the bivariate associations between the stigma subgroups and each of the variables in the model, and then I tested a full path model. So in terms of the mediators, suicidal ideation and condomless sex, there was an association between stigma and condomless sex, but the more striking of the two was the association between stigma and suicidal ideation. So you see 17% for the low group, 34% for the medium group, and 53% for the high group. So as stigma went up, suicidal ideation very clearly also was higher. And then this is the bivariate association with the outcome. I did a combined um, HIV STI incident infection variable, um, partly because of the, the low size in the outcome for HIV incident infections, but when I looked at them separately, there was still a dose response association. And what I found again is that as stigma severity went up, so did the outcome from 11% to 14% to 19%. So this is the full path model that I tested. The numbers that you see are regression coefficients and then standard errors in the parentheses. All direct associations were significant, as was the indirect association or the mediation analysis. And so I entered disclosure to family as the primary predictor variable of stigma, but there were a number of other covariates in here. And then I found that suicidal ideation and condomless sex did partially explain the relationship between stigma and new HIV STI infections, and that's post-enrollment. So that's after they've enrolled in the study, they've gotten their HIV counseling, they've gotten these things that we believe are interventions, back to that topic you were just saying at the end of your Q&A. Um, there's still new infections going on, and it's associated with the stigma they had experienced prior to enrolling in the study. But I also found that there was still a direct significant association between stigma and new infections, and that makes sense because this one pathway is not going to explain the entire relationship between the two. So this analysis helps to suggest multiple points of intervention in which we might mitigate the impact of stigma on new infections, especially intervening on suicidal ideation or poor mental health. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about AIM-3, which pivots a bit away from the last two because it's looking at engagement with HIV testing services. And I first um, tested the main effects in the model, then the interaction effects, and then I didn't plan to do any qualitative interviews, but after I ran all the, the quantitative analysis and found the results, I was like, I really need to go there and talk to individuals in the study. So I applied for some funding, and I went one summer and, and spoke to 25 individuals in the study, mostly who were in the high and medium stigma groups. So I'll show through a diagram um, building up the, the model that I did. First, I started with the latent stigma variable, Variable, latent variables are indicated by a circle, and I adjusted it by several significant participant characteristics from earlier steps in the analysis. I then tested the main 
effect of stigma on HIV testing, and I did not find a significant association. So this was something that was contrary to my earlier hypothesis. I did find a significant main effect of suicidal ideation on HIV testing. So as you can see from the adjusted odds ratio, individuals who had ever thought of committing suicide, regardless of stigma class, were 21% less likely to have had an HIV test prior to enrollment in the study. Then I did the interaction analysis. And you can see the adjusted odds ratio for high versus low at 0.65 which did not reach significance, but I think that that probably was due to the smaller sample size of this group in comparison to the other two. And then the medium versus low, which had also a lower odds ratio. So both of these are lower than suicidal ideation alone, suggesting a negative synergy between these two variables. Um, individuals in the medium stigma class were 54% less likely to have an HIV test as compared to those in the low stigma class. So now I want to highlight, oh, the qualitative findings. So um, there's a lot more than what's going to be on the screen, but these are the ones I pulled out that are really relevant to AIM-3. First, most of the people that I interviewed were very fearful of seeking health services at a facility for the general public. So most of them avoided that. One person said, whenever I'm sick and I need to go to the hospital, I used to be scared. What if this doctor find out that I'm gay? So I wouldn't go to the hospital. I would just stay home and be fine. In contrast, they felt safe and accept accepted at the study clinic. One person stated as, this is my organization where I belong. But despite that, many described enduring feelings of trauma following stigma and the desired additional psychosocial support than what was offered at the study clinic and CBO. One person who was a staff member at MSM said, we have a lot of victims of suicide, we do. We have a lot of victims of depression, people who are depressed and they need to talk to either a psychologist or someone who can provide psychological counseling for people. So I'm gonna highlight some, I think, of the most important public health implications of the research. In terms of the aggregate stigma measure developed, individuals more clearly identifiable as breaking masculine norms, either because of their non-male gender or their disclosure, suffered the worst stigma and are really in need of interventions to address the violence and other forms of stigma that they're experiencing. They were experiencing stigma at multiple levels of the socio-ecological model. They were experiencing stigma from family, friends, the police, so we can't develop anti-stigma interventions that are narrow in scope. We really need to have them be comprehensive in approach. Also, we need to address the trauma and mental health they're experiencing and integrate them as routine components of health services delivered to MSM. Right now, that is not happening. And then lastly, we need to promote psychosocial support and a sense of community for these individuals that oftentimes cannot interact with each other because it's not safe to do so. And I think that if we're able to provide them with more social support, we can help them develop resiliency and therefore also engage more in health services. So some of the promising interventions, we're gonna really need um, a set of creative solutions to to essentially eliminate the pernicious impact of stigma, especially in low-resource settings where there, there isn't a lot in comparison to a place like here. There's a paucity of mental health professionals. Um, when I looked at the Mental Health Atlas, there are 0.1 psychiatrists per 100,000 people in Nigeria as compared to 12.4 here in the U.S. So there are 124 times more psychiatrists in the U.S. Um, so that, that situation's not gonna change anytime soon, so what can we do about it? A few things are that we can use peer lay health workers to deliver mental health interventions in conjunction with linkages to mental health professionals. And we see that in the literature as some promising task sharing or task shifting models. We also could integrate trauma-informed care approaches that have been found to be successful in the U.S. over there um, that would not be a high resource necessary intervention. Some MSM are not gonna want to go to study clinics and CBOs or they're not even gonna find them um, through their networks. 
So I think that we need to expand the reach of HIV services, and one promising way to do that is to deliver, to offer HIV self-testing, which is recommended for MSM at this point because it's been found to increase the frequency of HIV testing, and it's also found a large proportion of undiagnosed infection. And some ways that we might do that is to utilize social networks and also to utilize internet recruitment because a lot of these individuals are online on these dating websites or dating apps. And then lastly, I think that we need to directly address stigma. A lot of times we do things around stigma or that indirectly impact stigma, but I really think we need to, to take on stigma itself. Um, and some of the reasons why I think that, when I was speaking to the MSM the summer I went there, a lot of them spoke about the, the strength and the encouragement that they felt from knowing about human rights frameworks and knowing HIV education. And um, it, it emboldened them to address these issues. So I think that we also need to educate them on the way that stigma impacts their mental health and their physical health in order to further empower them in the work that we're doing. And to integrate this with, you know, multi-level programming. So not only teaching MSM about stigma, but also sensitizing providers, people that interact with them about the impacts of stigma. And so that's it. And I want to thank you and especially thank the staff and the participants in Nigeria that are literally risking their lives for this type of research. Um, and if you want to know more, I have two of the papers published and the third is on its way out the door uh, and will be published in a couple months. Um, and then if I'm not running over time, I'll say that I'm working on a fourth paper. This is the model of what I found so far where I'm going to be looking at the qualitative data to look at um, coping behaviors um, following stigma and how these may or may not be, you know, facilitative of good mental health. So thank you. <laughs> Should I stay for questions? Of course. Okay. Seeing this was a nice, comprehensive presentation, and I see a lot of fingers going up. Let's start over there. So are you talking about um, at the study clinic or just more broadly? Um, I was just curious more broadly. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not as familiar. There, there are large organizations. They do receive a lot of funding from the U.S. Like PEP, it's one of the largest recipients of PEP for funding. So they are delivering ARTs. Um, I'm not sure that if the, at the time they were giving it to everyone regardless of like CD4 count. Um, so in the study clinic, for example, MSM were able to get on ART as soon as possible regardless of their health status, whereas I believe if they didn't participate in the study and they were just tested through the CBO, um, they, they previously had not been able to get on ARTs immediately until their CD4 was lower. Um, so these specialized studies do offer easier access to ARTs, but there are other places where they could get ARTs. They, but they would have to probably um, go to a general health facility, which a lot of them are fearful to do, because they're fearful of being outed in the experience of going for the exam. I, I, I wasn't raising my hand, but I was going to say, it's really, <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like the, the role of the church here is one thing. Mm -hmm. In Vegas, for those of you who have, have not been there, it's like it's like night and day. Let's say let's say the general you know environment is fairly poor. The churches are these mega complexes 